Welcome to Progenesis Academy second workshop on embryo, embryo grading system. We're very excited to have a great panel of experts in embryology. We have Debbie Venier. She's the co-founder and uh, director of trainer at the World Embryology School and Training. We have um, Zeki Behan. He's the IVF lab director at IVF Fertility and IVF Center of Miami. We have Bill Venier the co-founder and trainer at World Embryology Skills and Training, and also IVF lab director at San Diego Fertility Center. And we have Kim Pomeroy, he is the scientific director at the World Egg Bank. Thank you so much for attending the webinar and for your contribution. Well, today we're gonna have a five, se uh, five sessions uh, on how to grade embryos. We have uh, five speakers. We're going to start first with Debbie. And then after each presentation, we're going to post a couple of pictures, embryo pictures, for the audience to score. So once you get the link, click on it. And then you can give us your scoring system. And after the fifth presentation, we're going to discuss the scoring along with other things. Um, and with this, we're going to start our first presentation. Davey, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Let me make sure I can get this up and running. Uh, I'll do a slide presentation. Okay, so um, when I'm gonna start, I'm basically kind of paired mine down to just going over day five embryo grading since we only have five minutes each to get through grading. So I think some of them might be talking about day three or even eggs, but I'm going to focus on uh, day five grading. And what we use, a, what I typically use is just what I call a modified Gardner grading system. I think um, most labs do use this, but some also have other methods. So what I tend to break it down is expansion, trophectoderm, and I see, excuse me, and ICM. The expansion, we grade one through six, one being an early blastocyst with less than 50% of the embryo being the blastocele, two being an expanding blastocyst with a little bit more than 50% of the embryo being um, blastocele, three would be an expanded blastocyst, but not thinning of the zona, but the blastocele is full 100%. Uh, four is what we call a fully expanded blastocyst with a thinning zona and the size of the embryo is actually growing. Five would be a hatching blastocyst with cells herniating from the zona. And that can vary from just a couple of cells herniating, herniating out to 75% you know, of the embryo coming out. All of those would still be considered a five. Um, and six is fully hatched. The embryo is no longer in contact with the zona. Um, when we look at intercell mass and trophectoderm, we grade A through C. I think the original Gardner system had a D in there as well, but we found that we never used D. I think maybe we were just afraid to tell a patient that their embryos were actually D. So C is pretty much as low as we'll go. So um, an A inner cell mass is when the ICM is composed of many cells that are compacting. A B grade inner cell mass is composed of fewer cells. And again, fewer is kind of a very subjective term. And of course, embryo grading is extremely subjective. So what one talented, experienced embryologist might call an AB, somebody else might call it a BB. And sometimes it's very debatable on what you're looking at and how the embryo is actually positioned when you're looking at it. Um, so a C grade embryo is very few cells, um, but definitely still an ICM present with the potential of becoming a fetus. The trophectoderm also A through C with lots, uh, grade A would be um, lots of cells present with a nice um, scalloped edge. B would be fewer trophectoderm cells present. Um, you may see some unincorporated cells around the edge. And then C would be the fewer trope cells, maybe even some degenerating cells. Um, and sometimes you'll see that one cell is spanning like a quarter or a third of this of the side of the trophectoderm. That's typically a dead giveaway that we're going to call it a C grade embryo. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, 
This is actually a video. I do always prefer to grade embryos on a video versus a two-dimensional image because the three-dimensional allows you to see all the way through the embryo. So I'm gonna play this short video and it kind of zooms in on um, the blastocyst up top. So here the inner cell mass is a little bit unique because it looks like it's kind of sitting up on a pedestal. So somewhat questioning, there's um, lots of trophectoderm cells, but not so many that I would call an A grade. There's some up in that, you know, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock position up here that, oh, hold on, let me pause the video. Let me go back. Okay, pause. Oh, I paused it in a blurry spot. I'm sorry, I'll get better at this, I promise. Okay, um, so the trophectoderm cells here, 10 to 12, really thin, but lots of cells on the rest. So I would probably grade this trophectoderm a B. Someone might wanna argue with me that it's a C or an A, and that's, you know, it, it varies, but I'm gonna give it a B grade. The, the inner cell mass here has a decent amount of cells. It is compact, but I'm probably going to give it a B grade. One, because I can see some cells that are kind of not incorporated here. I'm not so sure I love the fact that it's sitting up on a pedestal like that. It's a little bit unusual, um, but definitely some healthy cells and it is compact. So I would probably call this a BB. And then again, looking at the zona, it is thinning. A nice comparison here to these other embryos where you can see the full size of an embryo that hasn't started to thin. So I would probably call this a 4BB. And then if we move down to this embryo down below, that's an earlier blastocyst with lots of extruded cells. You can see all these cells right here are unincorporated cells pretty much from 11 o'clock all the way around to five o'clock um, are all unincorporated cells. So definitely gonna be downgrading it there. It's a very early blastocyst. So I'm probably gonna call this a two. Um, inner cell mass looks decent and the trophectoderm cells look okay. There's just not a lot. Um, so I'd probably call this an AB, a two inner cell mass graded A and then trophectoderm probably in the B to C range. I don't like the fact that all these cells are not incorporated. It's gonna downgrade it. And then the fact that there just aren't a lot of trophectoderm cells. So that's kind of how I would grade that. You can see that all the way up and down. So again, B, C, three expansion. But again, over here, I originally, when I made the slide four B, C, two B, C. All right. Moving on to the next slide. So here is just another example of a size four blastocyst with a decent inner cell mass, again, with some cells that aren't really incorporated nice and tight into that blast, into that inner cell mass, and some trophectoderm cells that are stretching from 12 o'clock all the way down to three o'clock. I don't really like to see one cell spanning that large range in the trophectoderm, so that's going to downgrade that. So I put over here on the side four different grades that I think if you were to go through 20 embryologists, that's probably four different grades that you would see people grade this embryo. Um, again, the inner cell mass from this view looks to have enough cells, but I don't like the fact that there's some cells there that aren't incorporated and even looks like there might be in the distance here a vacuole that's formed. So I'm gonna grade that inner cell mass a grade B. Expansion is gonna be four because I see a nice thin zona. And then trophectoderm is going to be in that BC range. Again, because I see one cell spanning a full quarter of the embryo, I'm probably going to grade that a C. So I would grade this embryo a 4BC. Again, very subjective, very debatable, but that's what I would grade it. So here I took a picture of the same embryo within four different planes just to kind of exhibit the fact that depending on where you're looking at the embryo, you're probably gonna give it a different grade. So it's very, very important that when you are doing grading that you are spanning up and down on the microscope and seeing everything that's available. Because if you were to zoom in on the center plane of the embryo, which is this upper right quadrant, you don't really see the inner cell mass very well and you'd probably grade this a CC quality embryo because you can't see the inner cell mass, but in other planes of the embryo, you can see the inner cell mass is pretty, pretty hefty, lots of cells, and it's fairly compact. 
um, in the bottom right quadrant, you can see pretty clearly there's some, some cells that are kind of not incorporated, not tightly compacted. Um, so kind of interesting to see what would you grade this? And I, I graded a three BC, three because the zona hasn't quite thinned enough for me to call it a four. It has started to, but just if it starts to form um, that four, I'm not calling it a four until it really is thinning out and the embryo is actually starting to grow above or uh, past what a normal size of an embryo is up to that stage. So I'm gonna give this embryo a BC because the sum of the cells of the inner cell mass are starting to slough off and the trophectoderm cells, there's just not enough, enough of them. And you can see that in the upper right quadrant where again, one or two cells on the not six to nine o'clock position is stretched way out. And again, the 12 to three o'clock position is stretched way out. So not something I love, but it's definitely a viable embryo. Um, okay, so this one I think is pretty interesting because if that big, large degenerated cell was not in there, I would call this embryo a 4AA. It's beautifully expanded, lots of cells in the terfectoderm and nice scalloped edge. The inner cell mass is big with lots of cells, tightly compacted. It's pretty picture perfect. But then you see that big degenerated cell in there and you kind of squint and go, well, I don't know. So would you downgrade for this? Would you not? Is the embryo just not going to be bothered by that or is? It's such a big, ugly cell. I get bothered by it. But um, I would have a hard time grading this embryo a 4AA with a big degenerating cell inside the embryo. So I would probably grade it a 4BA, but the inner cell mass actually looks good. So I would like to actually hear when the other speakers talk, what would you guys grade that? What would you grade it? Fellow embryologist in my lab right now is thinking a 4AB or call it a 4AA with a notation that there's a degenerating cell there. Good idea. Okay, so the next um, embryo, again, I'm gonna call it a four, but debatable as to whether or not you can call it, uh, trying to move this out of the way, whether or not you can call it a A or a B for the inner cell mass. So inner cell mass has a decent amount of cells, but again, you probably wanna zoom up and down to see how many cells are in there. So we've got decent trophectoderm, but again, not a lot of cells that I'm going to call an A quality. So I'm going to call this probably a 4AB on, again, debatable as to whether or not the trophectoderm is that. So this I had a question because grading ultimately is for us to decide what embryo are we going to choose to transfer, what embryo are we going to choose to thaw, what embryo are we going to choose to biopsy. And I think having a rock solid grading system and a rock solid system as to how you choose which one is the best because A, B, and B, A, which is better? Do you choose trophectoderm over inner cell mass or do you choose inner cell mass over trophectoderm? It varies from lab to lab. So this was an interesting situation. I had a great discussion in a lab that I was in about a month ago and they had these two embryos on day five for a fresh transfer. And the embryo on the right probably would call it a 3AA but debatable if you wanted to call that a B range. And then the embryo on the right is definitely a four, but definitely has some degenerating cells in it. So um, we ended up transferring the embryo on the left because it was better quality, but less expanded. So what I'm interested to see what people like is do you choose one, trophectoderm over inner cell mass. Do you choose expansion over trophectoderm, expansion over inner cell mass? What I thought was interesting was at the lab that I was in, they actually chose trophectoderm over expansion over inner cell mass. So the inner cell mass was the least of their worries, which I thought was interesting because I think old school ways, most of us were always inner cell mass, inner cell mass, it has to be the best. And a little bird told me, I think it was Joe Conahan many years ago, and I, I liked this quote, said that trophectoderm cells can give rise to inner cell mass cells, but inner cell mass cells cannot give rise to, to trophectoderm cells. And 
I haven't researched that statement recently, so I'm not sure that still holds true. But if any of you guys can follow up with that, that would be awesome. But I would be interested to know who weights trophectoderm over ICM or whatnot when you're choosing an embryo. I tend to choose trophectoderm over ICM as well, but um, some of the labs that I'm in still choose inner cell mass first. So that's something you might wanna discuss and see, look at your data and see how your implantation rate is and your pregnancy rate with um, better trophectoderm and maybe a lesser inner cell mass. All right, so that's my five minutes and I might've gone a little bit over, but I try. Okay, I'm all done. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is um, uh, David Weininger. Um, Dr. Weininger is the IVF lab director at Atlantic Reproductive Medicine Specialist. David, thank you so much for attending. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. All right, I'm going to I'm going to concentrate on blastocyst grading also, because uh, we don't do any anything on day three, and um, we we do the same thing a modified Gardner um, grading system, which is it's actually a little more modified than um, than. Um, the, uh, Debbie's uh, modified. So just a little bit about our lab, um, how we do our embryo culture. Um, we embryos are not observed following fertilization check on day one. Uh, we do not observe them or do laser hatching on day three. Uh, we do approximately 75% PGTA and we do our laser hatching on day, at the time of biopsy, day five or six or seven. Uh, so 75% there, the remaining patients have freeze-alls except for Invacel patients. And blastocysts are scored at the time of biopsy and prior to FET. Okay, I'm just gonna go over some uh, some some of the grades we see on day five. When you know, since we don't look at them before, we have all, all kinds of stuff on day five. So this is the amoyla, of course. Uh, no signs of cavitation at all, and a very thick zona pellucida. This one may be ready on day six, or possibly early day seven for biopsy. Okay, the next one is a cavitating moila, uh, very, you know, a very small cavity and still a thick, thick zone of pellucida. Again, this is one, this would be a day five uh, cavitating moila. It uh, may be ready day six again or early day seven. Now this is grade, a uh, grade one expansion, which uh, in this one, the blastocyst cavity is less than a half the volume of the blastocyst. And as you see, the zone of pellucida is still thick. So you can, you, you definitely are starting to see uh, formation of, of uh, uh, the trophectoderm, uh, but you don't see any inner cell mass yet. And it's still very, very early embryo. We wouldn't, uh, freeze this and certainly wouldn't biopsy it. This is a grade two expansion. Uh, blastocyst cavity is greater than half the volume of the blastocyst. And you start to see a little bit of uh, thinning of the zona pellucida, but it's still, you know, still rather thick. This is one that, uh, you know, we would not biopsy this but if we have a good number of other ones to freeze on a freeze-all, we would not possibly uh, freeze something like this and uh, either thaw it out the afternoon before or very early in the morning and let it uh, culture uh, 
four or five hours before we transfer them. Okay, these are grade three expansions. Uh, and th these are usually the ones that we end up uh, biopsying uh, or freezing most of the time on day five. Uh, you see the blastocele cavity fills uh, almost all of the all of the uh, blastocysts, and the zona pellucida is very is uh, very thin. So uh, these are nice embryos. So these are ones that we biopsy quite a quite a bit of time, and and also uh, uh, freeze for yeah, freeze all patients. Now our grade fours we. Uh, say are are starting to herniate a little bit. Some of the trophectoderm cells are beginning to herniate through the zona pellucida. And again, you see the, of course, the zone is very thin. Uh, see all the, uh, the other parts of the embryo that we'll talk about in a minute, but you are starting to see some herniation of the uh, embryo. And okay, the, the grade five, uh, this is, uh, we say that it's completely hatched from the zona. So this is our grade five. Uh, so of course, these are, are fairly difficult to biopsy, but uh, we do that, you know, do that quite often. And uh, uh, this is uh, the grade five is about as far as we go. Uh, we, our grade six, uh, or when, when they are hatched because we have done assisted hatching on them. So that's where we go with the grade six. The grade five is where they hatch on their own. Okay. Now we're uh, grading, grade the blastocysts are graded uh, by the organization and compaction of their ICM with a score of A, B, or C. Uh, ICM score A, uh, the ICM is tightly packed to many cells and it's good. You can see the ICM uh, uh, in sort of in the middle and it looks really good. Uh, ICM score B, it's a more loosely packed ICM, fewer cells and it's fair. And ICM score C, see few to no cells in the ICM and it's poor. So we usually don't biopsy uh, C embryos most of the time. Um, we will do, if we look at them on, in their Cs, we will uh, see if they happen to get better uh, the next day or later in the day. But, uh, you know, BBs are, are fine, uh, but we do a lot of ABs and BAs. Okay, the, uh, the, tro the trophectoderm, uh, we look at that, uh, graded by the cellular organization and the number of the trophectoderm cells. Again, A, B, and C. Uh, tr trophectoderm score A, you see uh, many small trophectoderm cells. Uh, it's cohesive epithelial layer. Uh, so the epithelium is like in mammals is the, uh, the trophectoderm is the, really the first um, type of epithelial layer in, in the embryo, in the growing fetus. Uh, and this one is a very good embryo. Uh, so we like to see, we really like to see these for um, biopsy or vitrification. Uh, trophectoderm score B, uh, see a moderate number of larger cells forming a loose epithelial layer and uh, we would call this one fair. So you, you do see that the difference between the trophectoderm, the, the, the size of the trophectoderm cells between B and, and A. Now the trophectoderm score C, uh, very few to no trophectoderm cells and this would be poor. Okay, other points to consider. Um, 
uh, it's important not to biopsy any blastocysts that you would not ordinarily vitrify without biopsy. So the um, the grading is very important at this point. The, uh, it's always very important, but you don't want to biopsy uh, poor blastocyst because, like I say, the, on the next point, there's been times that I've biopsied, you know, one that's not so great, and it came back with no results. So then you're faced with, uh, if they want to re-biopsy it, you're faced with thawing a poor blastocyst, trying to biopsy it, re-biopsy it again. So uh, we should have a, you should have a blastocyst grade that you stick with uh, for biopsies that that you won't go less than a like a, a B minus, B minus, something like that. You want to make sure that you have a good number of tropectoderm cells. Um, and I agree with Debbie that I, I, I tend to uh, like to have a, a good a trophectoderm uh, other than the ICM. I really like to see an expanded embryo with a very good trophectoderm uh, and maybe not as good as an IC, ICM. I mean, it'd be great to have both, but uh, I really like the uh, uh, ICM better you know, having a really good trophected our layer. And that's, uh, that's all I have. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it. Um, we are, uh, we have sent a poll questions and I think only a few people fill out that that is a, an essential piece of what we are doing today is to get a good sense of how embryologists uh, score the embryos. And I'm going to show you guys how to um, um, how to click on that link and to fill out the information. So there is a link on the chat. So if you click on it, uh, it will open a page. Uh, and then that page will show the embryo image and the grade. And you just have to select your answer. And then you submit. And with that, we're gonna get the stats that we are going to discuss uh, later on in this uh, workshop. So please uh, click on that link on the chat and submit your, uh, your scoring. Thank you so much. And our next speaker is Zeki Behan. Um, Zeki is the IVF lab director at Fertility and IVF Center of Miami. Zeki, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Nabil. As usual, it is a very nice uh, uh, platform to be on and discuss these uh, interesting, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, these interesting issues, basically. Thank you. Um, uh, after Debbie and David's excellent overview of the nitty gritty of the uh, day five uh, grading system, probably uh, my, my presentation is going to be more of an overview. Um, and Riley, can we start the um, presentation? I believe you have the control, Dr. Behan. Okay, let me yep. see that. Okay, great, all right. All right, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, after those uh, excellent uh, details given uh, by Debbie and David, uh, I'll just uh, give my uh, overview of uh, about the overall grading uh, system we have and also a uh, couple of issues uh, related to uh, the grading we uh, or uh, almost everybody's doing in the field basically and uh, I'll just leave it there. Um, uh, as, as, as all of you know, I mean, uh, morphological assessment of embryos are with us for a long time from the first day uh, of uh, IVF and then we start to look at these embryos, not surprisingly. And uh, even though that is the case, I and mean, it's one of the, to, to my judgment, this is one of the uh, most misunderstood processes we do in the lab. Uh, not necessarily among the embryologists, but uh, among the patients and uh, even uh, so sometimes uh, among the uh, clinicians, actually. I mean, I, it's not very uncommon for me to have discussions about, you know, why did we select uh, 4BB on day five versus uh, 6AA on day six? Uh, or is that is that the reason for the non-pregnancy or the, 
I mean, this is not this is not a very uncommon uh, process. Uh, I, I I experienced here and there. Uh, as as you all know, I mean, subjective subjective nature nature of the whole process uh, makes it uh, kind of difficult for us uh, to standardize and come up with standard uh, solutions and uh, just compare, uh, especially from lab to lab, from embryologist to embryologist. Uh, it is it is difficult to do, do the comparisons or so. Even with that, I mean, even with uh, several attempts to come up with other ideas to, uh, you know, judge the embryos and judge their developmental potential, it's still around and it's what it's one of the uh, most commonly used methodologies we uh, we, all, we do uh, we just basically do in the laboratory. If you look at the large data sets, I mean, definitely we see overall correlations and associations with the morphological grade and uh, outcomes of uh, IVF. But it is not a one on one relationship. And uh, sometimes I do believe that it's, it, it's, we, we just could uh, not, we, as again, when I, when I mention this, I think I generally go back to patient and uh, in certain cases, clinicians. I mean, we are putting over emphasis, I mean, too much emphasis on. Uh, grades, especially uh, at the very extremes. And again, I mean, it's, it's long overdue. I mean, we need to have a different uh, system, <laughs> a substitution for this one, but uh, uh, even with these morpho morph morphological assessment, with the kinetics, uh, uh, we don't have, we are not there yet, we don't have it. Uh, basically, this morphological uh, grading issue is gonna be uh, sting, uh, you know, staying with us for, for, for some time. Well, right, after after just a simple overview, I like to just basically ex to explain what we do in the uh, in our lab. Uh, I even though we also do everything at day five, uh, I just basically wanted to give an over uh, overall assessment uh, of what we do uh, in terms of uh, the embryo embryo checks. We we do day five, day one, day three, day five, and six, and almost uh, not almost, I mean, exclusively blastocysts. Uh, the transfer and a, a substantial amount of them are biopsy with a zona breach on day three. Uh, on day, uh, I mean, even though there are, there were attempts to come up with a you know grading system for all sites and uh, you know uh, PN stage uh, zygotes, uh, they are I mean according to uh, uh, data set, data and literature I mean they are not very predictive of or almost anything uh, anything or that those require very extensive uh, or specialized equipment. Uh, we don't have any uh, grading system for uh, all sites, basically, at, at the moment. We don't use at least in our uh, lab. We just basically uh, you know, note our uh, observations uh, in terms of abnormalities. I and mean, if there's an off-plasmic off granulation, vacuolation, or any perivitalin space abnormalities, zone of pollution abnormalities. And, we just leave it there rather than just uh, given a score and try to use that score as the basis for uh, you know evaluation of the embryo. On day one, again, we just go with the simple observation of fertilization status, and uh, if there are uh, you know abnormalities, just uh, numerical abnormalities, we just basically address those and then uh, make note of it. On day three, uh, uh, again, we use uh, a tiered system of one to four. And main uh, variables we look at: cell number, blastomere symmetry, and fragmentation, like almost everybody uh, everybody does. Uh, although we don't uh, use any, we don't do any day three chest or anything. We still uh, do a day three grading. And currently, we only use this for as, as some sort of tiebreakers uh, in embryo selection. If you see, if you have two similar embryos, and if you're trying to decide which one uh, needs to be transferred. That we can just go back and look at the day three uh, grades, and it, it just uh, that serves serves us as a uh, tiebreaker, basically. On day five and six, uh, again, Debbie and David just explained this already. We used uh, Gardner's grading system, so that means I'm going to skip the next couple of slides. Uh, they, they just make my life easier here, I believe, <laughs> or or maybe not. Uh, but I'm just going to go over at this and see. Okay. Oops, sorry. All right, this is, uh, again, I, 
uh, even though we don't use it right now, this is our uh, simple uh, grading system on day three. Uh, what we look for basically for the perfect uh, or good or excellent embryo versus uh, what we look uh, what we look at the embryos to grade them as you know uh, poor quality basically. So we're looking at the cell cell numbers. If it, if they are the cell uh, cell number wise, they're at the stage they are supposed to be between six to eight cell uh, by the seventy two hours and uh, the. Uh, Lastomer sizes are uniform, no fragmentation. That is going to be your uh, perfect, excellent embryo. And uh, on the other hand, if uh, the, the one one of the major uh, you know issues we are looking at here, the fragmentation. If the fragmentation is going to be a little more than ten percent, or the, the size of the lastomers are slightly uh, asymmetrical, then it's 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 going to just uh, grade. Uh, you know, change that tree one one tick down. Basically, it's going to be three. Uh, uh, if you just go down uh, down the down the tier, we're going to be basically looking at the embryos uh, which are delayed in terms of development, uh, in terms of cell number, or they are not delayed but they have extensive uh, problems with the fragmentation or uh, elastomer sizes and just indicate indicator indications of the you know series. Uh, cell uh, cell division uh, issues, and if the embryo is uh, you know basically more than uh, two to five percent fragmentation, or if there are major issues with the uh, si uh, size size of the blastomeres, or uh, the connections are not very clear, uh, these are basically our uh, uh, grade one uh, or the poorest quality embryo, uh, the poorest quality embryos on day three. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, currently we don't use these for any uh, selection criteria other than tiebreakers later down the road. But uh, again, it just gives us an idea about the uh, embryo's potential and embryo's uh, behavior uh, later down the road. I mean, blast selection is uh, somehow related to quality of uh, embryos uh, on day three as well. Uh, for velocity grading again, I'm not going to because I'm not going to go over this. This is sim simply uh, infamous uh, Gardner's uh, grading system, uh, as described by uh, earlier presenters. I'm not going to go into the details of these. Uh, and here, if, here I have uh, the classical pictures when it comes to the defining Gardner's uh, media. Uh, excuse me, Gardner, Gardner's uh, uh, grading gra grading system. Uh, again, uh, I'm not getting to details of those right now. One thing I'm going to mention here, though, uh, because like many other labs, we do uh, we do uh, biopsies uh, very extensively and uh, do reach the zone on day three. That that just throws in another complication in terms of uh, grading. Basically, it not necessarily with the cell grading, and you can still ICM. You can have a very good idea about the ICM size and morphology and also trophectomy. But in terms of stage uh, or expansion, uh, that bridge uh, basically uh, complicates uh, situation a little bit because of because of the artificial artificial uh, br bridge. I mean, these embryos are going to be basically uh, behave, behaving and looking like. Uh, embryos that are uh, slightly advent, uh, advanced stages compared to uh, uh, unbreached uh, embryos. So as you see here, for these these two uh, these two uh, blastocysts are basically uh, hatching, uh, not naturally, of course, uh, but uh, because of that uh, because of that uh, uh, I mean uh, not natural uh, status of this uh, stage or expansion. So we just try to compensate uh, somehow. And of course, that, that introduced another subjective uh, variable in the, in the system, of course, but this is our solution right now. Basically, if an embryo is hatching and uh, the, uh, the amount of, uh, the portion of the embryo ha uh, that hatch is less than uh, you know 50%, we just don't count that as a hatching embryo, but an expand, expanded embryo. We only call them hatched or hatching embryos uh, only if the uh, hatching portion of the embryo is more than 50%. Is, is this perfect? Of course not. It is, does that show another uh, subjective variable in the system? Yes, it does. Uh, but, but again, I mean, this 
this is unfortunately a one of the major shortcomings of the morpho morphological assessment we use, and we have been using for a long time actually. Uh, and in terms of uh, these grading systems, my uh, my uh, motto is actually the simple the simple system. The simplest system is basically is the uh, easiest and most informative one, uh, as long as we, uh, we we show you know very uh, you know strict correlation correlation between outcomes and certain uh, morphological parameters. I mean, we unfortunately don't see those. Um, having said that, I'm gonna just basically bring you uh, an interesting, uh, I, just, I, I bet every, every one of you observed this, but I'd like to just bring it here. I, I find it interesting. This is, for instance, if you, uh, the, what, what we are seeing here is the embryo grading results from the latest uh, CAP uh, cat embryology survey. I mean, as you, as you know, uh, uh, labs uh, or their embryologists are looking at the same embryo, five, a set of five in day three and a set of five uh, of the uh, day five embryos. And we're talking about more than 100 uh, embryologists of uh, 100 labs are looking and uh, evaluating the same embryos. And it is a Overall pattern, and since since I started to use this system, and I, I, and there, there's nothing unusual about it, that it's always the same pattern. I mean, if you look at this, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about 100 embryo, more than 100 embryologists. This is the percentage of them selecting uh, or grading a given embryo as good or fair, and almost half. half. And if you are looking at here, the embryo C. Again, a, group, a, a large group of people are just calling a fair, the while other is just calling uh, you, you know, poor. This is, this is exactly the same on the uh, blastocyst side as well. I mean, you see those overlapping uh, you know, percentages in terms of embryologists selecting the exact same embryo with a different grade. grade. But uh, the one, uh, I mean, the, out, the take home messages from here is basically, Unless these embryos are, you know, very specifically different from each other morphologically, I mean, there is a, there's a big overlap. If you look at here, if uh, an embryo is not distinctly uh, excellent or distinctly poor, then there's a uh, there's a good chance of that the embryo is gonna get, you know, good, either good or fair versus uh, fair or poor grade. Basically, that 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 tells us that this type of a system like this actually only tells uh, or separates these embryos from each other only when they are at the extreme extreme edges. And this is one of the major shortcomings, uh, shortcoming of this uh, system we are using. And this is a simplified version. I and mean, this, this is basically a SART, uh, SART uh, morpho morphologic assessment, which is the simplified version we have. And we, even with the simplified version, uh, we, we have this overlapping uh, grading when, when, you are, when we are dealing with uh, multi uh, labs. In that sense, I mean, from uh, in my lab, rather than just basically looking at those, I like my embryos and myself uh, being consistent in the lab at least. I mean, I don't want my embryologist to select, you know, one embryo. One embryologist uh, is just selecting one embryo as grade, uh, grade A versus the other one. Just uh, as long as we are consistent in the lab, uh, that that is that I, that makes me happy basically. But uh, this uh, the subjectivity and lack of standardization is always a problem with morphology and it's always going to be with us. As I mentioned, uh, I like the very simplest uh, uh, systems as, unless the, there are proven, uh, proven uh, you know, advantages of using uh, you know, complicated systems. Uh, that's my motto in the lab uh, with almost everything. The simple is the beautiful, simple is, uh, is, is the best way to go basically. And I follow the same thing with the morphology assessments. And with that, I'll finish it and thank you very much. Thank you, Saki, thank you so much. Uh, we have just closed the first poll and then we are launching now the second poll. Uh, Riley just uh, sent a chat to all attendees if you can please click on the form and then give us your score of the embryos. Uh, this is so important because we really wanted to capture how many people are voting and, and what kind of grading system they are choosing. Um, and I think in the first poll, we had about 39 
people voting. I, I wish we could have a little bit more since we have about 90 attendees. Thank you so much. Now we are moving to the next speaker, uh, Bill Vignier. Uh, Bill is the co-founder and trainer at World Embryology Skill and Training and also lab director at San Diego Fertility Center. Bill, thank you so much for coming. The floor is yours, thanks. Thank you, Nabil and Progenesis for inviting me to this. Uh, great points by the, the speakers already. Um, I think I need, um, am I controlling again? Am I controlling? Yes, yes you are. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to start out. I kind of took a kind of a similar tangent to this talk that uh, Zeki just um, did a wonderful job with. Um, it's really the what, where, and why we do these embryo grading systems. And I'm going to start uh, in reverse order. So uh, why? Well, we got to provide information for the patient, information for the physician, and information for the lab. Um, but the information for the patient, of course, this is a very anxious time for them um, through this process. And this is one of the most uh, nerve wracking times of the whole process for them is when things are in the lab and waiting for their pregnancy test. So, uh, the more information we can provide them these days, the better, because they have a lot of information off the webs, website from friends and family that have gone through it. And, uh, you know, they may have some single thought in mind that they have to do it a certain way. Um, and that's not always the case. So, uh, and then for the physician, because the physician is going to come back to you and why this patient didn't get pregnant and so forth and so on. And then for the lab, just make sure the lab is doing well, KPIs are up to, to speed and those types of things. So this is why we do embryo grading and uh, to make sure all three of us are happy with the way things are going. Um, did I go too far here? Okay, I need to go back. Oh, there he goes. Okay. I still got to go back a little further. Sorry, folks. You're at the where. Uh, so, uh, you know, where do we do our grading? Well, we we do start with the embryo, um, and the uh, reason for that is you have to give some assessment of why blastocysts aren't developing well and those types of things. So you do have to start with the oocyte. We don't give too much information. We only really highlight the fact if it's fair. Uh, I mean, excuse me, if it's poor. Am I still on? Everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, that's where we start. Uh, we only really highlight why the eggs appear to be poor. If they're good and fair, we don't really say too much. Um, cleavage assessment on day three, we do change to fresh media on day three. We don't do hatching on day three. Um, and we don't grade on day three, but we get, we give a range of how things are going. So we do assess eight cells and above and less than eight cells is how we, how we present it to the physicians and, and the patients themselves. Uh, and then of course, why we're here is the blastocyst and how we grade blastocysts. I think everyone has done a good job uh, discussing that so far. So I'm not gonna really um, go too far into that. I think I'm delayed a little bit, let's see. Oh, there we go. 
What we use, uh, and it seems like everyone is using it, and we recently switched. I'm saying in the last six months, we went to the Gardner scale. And yes, we modified it pretty much like Debbie, um, where, but we don't start grading until it's a, uh, a stage three. So we don't do one and two. We do um, uh, early blast up to, to level three. So once it starts expanding uh, and thinning out the zone is when we start grading. Um, grades have been pretty much consistent with everybody else um, that has spoken so far. So the issues with this is it's very subjective and it, within myself, I'm subjective. So uh, I expect it to be subjective within my lab and um, within other labs and those types of things. So that is, you know, that's hard because we get a lot of embryos going, coming into us uh, and some going out. So those may not those grades may not correlate with where they're going or where they're coming from. Um, so that's kind of tough there. Um, it does show grading does show some correlation with uh, successful outcomes. Uh, it's not that great of a correlation, but there's correlation there. Uh, and then how do you describe failure when you're telling a patient this is a beautiful embryo? This is top of the line embryo. So you have to explain, hey, you know, we're looking at it through a microscope and hey, the PGT results are normal. However, there's other tools in that toolbox. You know, we're just one, uh, the embryo is just one tool there. So, um, and uh, I'll use some other analogies. Like sometimes it's uh, Debbie's favorite is, you know, it's not always the seed. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, the soil that are you. And then the guidelines, like uh, I, I believe uh, David uh, kind of said a little something about this is you have to set guidelines of you know, what you're gonna save, freeze, biopsy for these patients. Uh, no embryo embryologist wants to give false hope, but we always wanna give whatever opportunity is there and whatever possibility is there, even though if it's, it, it's not the greatest. These are just some eggs, but it gives us information. These are not good eggs whatsoever, but this provides us with information. It provides the physician with information to discuss it with the patients. So it's very valuable to get that uh, going at the egg stage. So other issues are, you know, what do I call this? Do I call this a 3AA or is this a 4AA? So one day I might call it a 3AA, the next I might call it a 4AA. And do I biopsy today or do I wait another day? So, you know, these are things we have to weigh as we're grading. Right, so here's another one. Well, do I biopsy this one? I would not biopsy this embryo. I would give it another day, get some more cells in there. Um, uh, we're a freeze-all program, so we don't really have fresh transfers that we have to get to. So um, even this would be questionable if the few patients that do come in for a fresh transfer after biopsy, uh, whether we would do this or not. It's a beautiful embryo though. And we're, are these worth freezing? So you gotta ask yourself, um, is this something you would freeze? The, the top left one that's totally hatched out you know, that, that inner cell mass doesn't look great, but is it gonna give the patient an opportunity? It's gonna give the patient an opportunity, again, not the best opportunity, but an opportunity. Um, and the, the bottom right one uh, is pretty good looking. And these are actually day seven embryos. So uh, we culture everyone to day seven. We give everything a chance. So this is my last slide. And what we have to do is think like a patient, like a physician, and like an embryologist. Thinking like a patient, the patient is pouring their heart and soul, financial, emotional, everything into this to try to get a family, try to get a child. 
So you got to think of it that way. If, if it's a 3% chance, that patient want, wants to take that 3% chance. On the other hand, if we think like a physician, um, it's tough to take hits like that because this is a st statistics driven medicine or medical practice that we have. Um, so uh, unfortunately, that's the way it, it's perceived uh, by patients is, hey, let's go with, see what their stats are. Well, that doesn't always correlate to actually what you're doing, even though we break it down between age groups and egg donors and those types of things. Um, but there's a lot to consider that way for the physicians to carry on and be successful. So an embryologist has to think for both. They have to think for the patient and think for the physician. And the embryologist is gonna do everything in their power to give a successful outcome to the patient. Um, and that's, that's our main goal, but we have to be realistic and not give false hope and not freeze uh, and biopsy everything that forms a blastocyst. So this is where the grading comes in, kind of the bottom line. Um, we need grading systems uh, that probably uh, can be a better at correlating to success and those types of things. So, uh, but here we are now with our current grading system that's been around for a long time, um, as everyone else said, uh, but we probably have to think in the future of probably uh, producing a better system um, that correlates to success. And I believe that's my last slide, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Bill. Now uh, we're going to launch a third poll with another three embryos to score. Uh, Riley, can you please uh, add the link? To the yes, chat. I will do that. Thank you. Okay, so why, while we are waiting for uh, Riley to post the link, uh, let me introduce the last speaker in this session. Uh, last speaker would be uh, Kim Pomeroy, uh, Dr. Pomeroy is the scientific director at the World Egg Bank. Kim, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Nabil. I would like to thank uh, Progenesis for this opportunity, and I hope that we can learn something here. I've already learned quite a bit. So uh, I want to ask everyone a question at the very beginning and think of this answer, and that is you have an uh, embryo a day five embryo. It's just a blastocyst. It has no inner cell mass. Have you ever then looked at it on day six and seen an inner cell mass? So think about that. Um, in talking about grading of embryos, I think we need to realize, first of all, very few of us really follow the Gardner grading system, mainly because there is no Gardner grading system. The system is the Gardner Schoolcraft system from 1999. Unfortunately, that uh, document is in a proceeding um, of a meeting, and so very few people have had access to that. And so most of us use, uh, I think the major reference to that was a Gardner Lane et al. reference from 2000. But in that, using the Gardner system for grading blastocysts, you do not grade early blastocysts. So that's one of the reasons all of us are probably using some form of modified system. I was glad to find out from Bill that uh, he tends to follow cl more closely the Gardner system. I think one of the other um, maybe shortcomings of the Gardner system is the C is the lowest grade. And that's fine, but the verbiage for the C, for example, is few. There's nothing that says no. So it's few inner cell mass, few trophectoderm cells. But what if there's only one or what if there's no? Maybe one is considered fuse. Um, I have been influenced lately since about 2017 uh, by a paper that uh, Dean Morbeck wrote in Human Reproduction. It was uh, something to the effect, is a grade C a failing grade um, in IVF? 
And uh, I'll get to that in a minute because I think he's, he's nailed something that we forget. But I'm gonna present a little bit of the SART grading system. This came out in 2010. If I remember right, I think uh, uh, Dr. Winninger was working with me on this committee. Um, but it is a very simple system. We've all seen it when we turn on our SART data, but very few of us use it for our day-to-day -day, um, input of the morphology of the embryos, probably because it's a narrower system. There's less descriptors in it. As you can see from this slide, it's a good, fair, or poor for both the ICM and the trophectoderm. So it's a very simple system, very easy to follow. Go to the next slide here. Maybe that didn't go, let's try again. Um, what I worry about though in the grading of embryos and everyone has brought this up is we do not really have a good system. The things that we lack in this system is we lack, there might be correlation, but how accurate is that correlation? You can get correlation to a lot of things, but is it useful? We have correlation to sperm numbers and male fertility, but is it really very useful? Other, you have modal sperm, they're swimming around or you don't. Probably, that's probably more, gives us more information, but there is high correlation to many things, but they may not be useful. And I think that's what is done with our embryo grading as uh, Dr. Behan and uh, Dr. Veneer have uh, pointed out. And that is that we have, we fool ourselves. I think we kind of do voodoo. And to me, voodoo is, when you expect the results from something that you're doing, but you have no way to explain it. You have no data to explain it. And that is what we don't have. We don't have a lot of good data. And as was pointed out earlier there with, uh, I think Dr. Bayhan pointed out, there is great overlap, even when we grade embryos and we may change our grading, the same embryo one day versus another. And there's a different grading from embryologist to embryologist. So how can this, a system help us very much. More than anything, we need a system that will allow us to pick out the best embryo, but we don't even know what the best is. We often say to our patients, it's a beauty contest. What does that mean? That means it's voodoo. We have no data to, to, sh to show whether a 3AA is better than a 4BA. So I like to talk about Cinderella embryos and worry about if our grading system has caused us to throw away chances for our patients. And that's another thing that I was very appreciative that uh, uh, that was brought up in the last talk by uh, Dr. Bill Veneer. And that is that we have to think from our patient's point of view. If you told them, we have all these good embryos, we're transferring, we're freezing. Here's an embryo that only has a 20% chance of uh, going to pregnancy. I'm gonna throw it away. I think they would be very upset with you, but we have to start thinking for them. So my Cinderella embryos that I talk about, the embryos that are kind of ragtag and don't look great and they don't get invited to the ball of the embryo transfer or the vitrification are poor embryos, usually grade C on the Gardner or modified Gardner system, slow growing embryos. These may be embryos that are as much as two days behind in development, but they continue to develop every day. And number three, blastocysts without an, ANC, without an ICM. And that's why I asked that initial question. Have you ever seen an embryo without an ICM go and have an ICM? Of course you have, we all have. And the reason is, is our eyes are not that good. We can't tell whether there truly is an ICM cell in there or not. We haven't uh, developed a vital stain that we can go in and determine which cells are ICM cells and which cells are trophectoderm cells. So we kind of guess. And I think when we do that, we may discard embryos that are worth transferring. And I think that doing biopsies has even pushed us into the corner of tossing embryos that might develop into babies. And the reason is, is you get to the point where you see this nice looking blast, but not very much ICM. And you may not go to day seven. So you discard it or you're doing your biopsy, you have all these good blastocysts, you have an early blastocyst, and uh, you say, you know what, this is delayed in growth, so we're not going to transfer it, and you don't grow it up and you discard it. 
And if you don't biopsy it, then you're forced into the either going ahead and waiting days until you biopsy it. Um, if you're doing uh, PGTA or you tell the patient it was unbiopsyable and it's discarded. And I've gotten data back from several places using donor eggs where they do biopsies. They have what could be an embryo that could develop into a fetus, but it's discarded because it was underdeveloped and they didn't want to tell the patient that, well, we, we can't biopsy it. So we're not going to let it grow longer. Or we're not going to attempt to even biopsy it. Let's see if I can go to the next one here. So here's an embryo that I would call in a Cinderella embryo. You might see what might look like part of a inner cell mass at about three o'clock, but it's hard to find something. Do you discard it or do you transfer it? Or do you even vitrify it? Especially if you only have, uh, this is your, uh, you might have several other embryos to choose from. You see, I'm trying to get this to advance. Here we are. Here's another hatch blastus. There might be an inner cell mass there over at three o'clock, but it's hard to discern. It's very loose. Do you transfer it? Do you vitrify it? Do you biopsy it? Here's another one, looks terrible. Has a lot of trophectoderm, has some disorganized trophectoderm, and maybe at 12 o'clock, there's a developing inner cell mass. Do you discard this? These are all what I would say are, um, have some C value in either the trophectoderm or the inner cell mass. Let's see. Here's another one. Well, we missed the other one. You know, what do you do with that one? Um, but what do you do with this one? Are you gonna try attempt to biopsy this? Probably not. What if you let it grow a couple more days though? You can see it's already trying to hatch out. So what happens? There are studies where they've looked at poor embryos. And here is one study by Bouillon et al. in 2017. And they compared the live birth rate of their good to their poor embryos. 46.8% versus 34.1%. Are you going to tell your patient, sorry, I discarded that embryo because I couldn't biopsy it? Or I discarded it because it was a poor embryo, yet it had a fairly good chance of implanting? Another study that was done, this by Hiroko and et al in 2009, they looked at implantation rates by the day of vitrification. So in the blue, that's a day five, orange day six, red day seven. They had very high implantation rates for all days of embryos. Why do we think that a day seven handles so much more poorly that it doesn't implant? Maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we are not um, transferring it into a properly prepared uterine environment and the endometrium is off. These are the questions we have to ask. And maybe that day seven would do very well if we vitrified it and transferred it into a program cycle. So I think that, first of all, I would recommend that everyone read Dean Morvick's 2017 paper in human reproduction. Blastus culture in the era of PGS and freezals is C a failing grade. I think we can also look at other potential um, embryos that we discard. What about embryos where we didn't see the, uh, two pro pronuclei developed or we only saw one? What are the possibilities that those pronuclei really were there, but they developed asynchronously? And does that mean that embryo does not have a good implantation rate? What should we do with that poor blastocyst? Blastocysts that appear to not have an inner cell mass and blastocysts that are delayed in development. I think if they're progressing, they should either be transferred or vitrified. We need to decide whether they're gonna to go to the ball or whether they're gonna be dumped in the trash. And I think if we ask ourselves, do I have data to discard that embryo because its pregnancy rate is so low, we'll find out we don't and we should stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great presentation, Kim. Uh, now we're gonna uh, wrap up the poll. We have one last question in the poll that we'll release later. Um, but um, 
I would like to get everybody on the table so we can start the discussion while Riley is computing the poll answers. So early on, Kim, you asked a question about uh, embryo ICM on day six. Can you repeat that question and, and see what the rest of the panel think of, of it? Yes, if you see, have you ever seen an embryo where there was no inner cell mass and we're talking about a blastocyst to a hatch blastocyst and I didn't see this on hatch blastocyst where you see and you don't see that think there's an ICM and you come back later in the evening uh, before you discard it and you check it and there's an ICM. Bill? Yeah. Let's start. Yeah, it, I mean, it's rare, uh, but it does happen. Um, we've seen, you know, uh, like Kim, you're saying, we do see blastocyst, beautiful trophectoderm with no inner cell mass. That's visible to us, as you're saying. But is there something there that we're unaware of? Is it flattened out somewhere and we just aren't catching it? Uh, it it's possible. We tend, well, uh, you know, to do those. To, yeah, to and I would also ask the question too is, one thing we don't know is we don't know what happens once the embryo gets transferred. Is it possible that the uh, inner cell mass will develop from trophectoderm cells if, as uh, Debbie alluded to, um, they could uh, differentiate from the TE into the ICM later when they're implant implanted or transferred? Yeah. Or do they lead to, you know, implantation with no, no fetal matter in there? Yeah. Oh, Tim, I don't I think I've, I've seen something where there's definitely no ICM at all, but I have seen where we really poor ICM or maybe just a couple of cells where we just keep it in culture over day, overnight, but the next day it's had time to grow and divide and it looks a little better. It's a little bit more compact and it's something that we would keep. So I think sometimes it just needs a little more time to grow. It's, it's just not textbook embryo, but with an extra 24 hours of culture, it's able to show us that it's there. <laughs> it can do it. Yeah. Any other comments before I jump into my next question? Yeah, we see we see the same thing. Sometimes on late day five, it doesn't look that great, but uh, by day six, it seems to be maybe a little more organized, and that we can go ahead and uh, biopsy it or uh, cryopreserve it. We don't do any fresh transfers, but. Uh, uh, I've definitely seen them get more, the ICM get more organized uh, after maybe 24 more hours of culture. Fantastic, Zeki? Uh, we, also, we also see that uh, phenomenon uh, once in a while, not very often, but my take on that is uh, like, like Kim mentioned, I mean, it's not a transformation of, you know, to affect their own cells into ICM or the other way around. It's just basically, uh, because of the expansion or the basic pressure in the uh, blastocyl cavity, some of those ICM cells are just basically not discernible to us. That's 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 uh, that's what I think. And I, again, in terms of the transformation we just discussed uh, about, I mean, transforming from from to affect themselves the ICM is, from my point of view, and based on my experience, I try to do I try to grow a lot of uh, stem cells. Not, not in human stem cells, but in stem cells. And uh, when we try to do those, when, it, when we try to culture ICM, ICM cells to get our stem cells, I mean, we always see the differentiation into uh, trophectoderm-like cells from ICM cells, but it never uh, the other way around. I, I don't know, of course, we cannot expand uh, this, uh, I mean, extrapolate this, what happens in the embryo after transfer, but my take on that is that if there is any transformation from one cell type to another, it is from ICM to trophectoderm, not uh, the, the other way around. Very good. So uh, both uh, you, Zeki, and Bill have spoken a little bit about grading embryos on day three. Uh, I know some embryologists that don't grade till the blastocyst stage. How important is grading on day three? And I'll start with you, Kim, maybe, and go and I'll go through the list. Is it important? Uh, Kim? Oh, me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you is know, it important to grade on day three? It depends. I know there are some people, 
Um, I especially know that Catherine Rakowski um, uses it quite a lot for her KPI and leans on it heavily. So um, I imagine, although she does a lot of blastus transfer, she probably still does that for her quality control. Um, but there are many things that we've measured in the past. I think as scientists, we always think we have to measure things. We used to measure um, the expansion of the cumulus cells. We wasted so much time on that and I don't think it told us anything. Um, and so it might be the same thing with day three. Um, really what matters is what is it gonna be on the day when we transfer or the day we vitrify it? But without any data, everything's kind of uh, up in the air. I think we know that, I think there's some work that good and fair embryos uh, trans, uh, they implant at about the same rate in some studies. Um, and the only difference is that poor are a little bit poor. Thank you so much. Divi? We found that the day three data didn't change anything we did on day five and day six. It changed nothing. All it did was kind of give the patient and the doctor peace of mind that the embryos were growing and they didn't die. Um, but we've never had everything die on day three anyway. So um, we still did continue to do a day three check, like Bill mentioned, but really just, yes, the embryos are growing and we give like a single overall good, fair, poor grade, but we're not giving individual grades. It's just, it's just time consuming and it doesn't change anything we do. It doesn't change the, the plan for the patient and it was just time consuming. So we stopped doing it. We stopped hatching and made, made the lab a little bit more efficient, but that was our, our plan. Thank you. Uh, David? Yeah, I agree with, with Debbie. We, uh, we like to leave the embryos in the, uh, uh, the MIRI uh, and don't take them out. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I think the reason to take them out is, is uh, mainly for the embryologist. I don't think it helps the patient at all. Uh, so we haven't, we never look at them on day three. Uh, so, and then I think if you look at them on day three, you have to say something to the physician and the physician has to say something to the patient. So uh, we just leave them alone, leave them in the incubator where the, they get the best environment uh, that we can give them in the lab. And, uh, and then we just look at them on day five. And that's, uh, we just like to leave them, leave them, leave them alone after birth check. Thank you so much. Zeki? Uh, my answer is actually yes and no, depending on what you're trying to do, actually, as, as Kim alluded to. I mean, if the idea is just basically getting the blastocysts at the end of the day, which is five freeze or transfer, well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely, I agree with that. There's no need to look at those guys at day, day three. I mean, maybe it's going to affect the development uh, you know, negatively because of that taking out and exposing them to environment more than it's supposed to. I mean, that's absolutely, I agree with that. But on the other hand, uh, having that data, this, got, this, this is where my, uh, you know, data or science, uh, you know, mind comes in. Uh, if having that information and then later down, I mean, just try to, you know, uh, correlate anything, uh, anything with that data uh, is always an interesting aspect uh, for, for me, basically. That's why if that is the, if that if that uh, if that is the case, or if you are interested in just uh, looking at the data and try to uh, you know correlate with uh, other aspects of development later down the road, that that is that is that is an interesting uh, idea to look at. For instance, in, in certain cases though, because of that embryonic genome activation is just basically kicks in after day three, and it it might uh, it, in the long term might give us some indications, you know, where the failure is coming from for uh, paternal or maternal origin. I mean, we, we can ask a lot of, these are mainly academic questions actually, and there are, the, we don't have a lot of data to support those and uh, justify the, uh, you know, just take it, taking those out. But again, it depends, honestly speaking, without, if you don't take those embryos out, it's not gonna change anything at the end of the, at the end of the, uh, you know, culture period. But I still would like to have an idea how they how they develop, or yeah. what I mean, is that somehow related to you know uh, maternal side or paternal side of the uh, developmental process, basically. Thank you so much, uh, Bill. Yeah, my major point here for doing the day three check is not to shock anyone on a poor cycle. 
So instead of waiting until the end, let's get some information in the middle um, to the physicians and their patients. Um, our embryology team <coughs> updates the patients. So once anything is in the lab, till it's out of the lab, the embryologists uh, contact the patients and give them the updates. So we want to provide some feedback on how things are going. It, uh, it can be very bad uh, uh, from a patient point of view is, okay, you contacted me on day one on fertilization. I had 19 embryos and you're telling me here on day five or day six or day seven that I only have three left or something along those lines. So those types of things, it's helpful to explain to patients on if it is going bad, you're setting them up, them up for a bad cycle. It's not as shocking. Thank you. And, and we, we don't really grade, we're, we're, we're giving a, a range of what we expect and are they in or out of that range? So eight cells and above is what we wanna see and then less than eight cells. And we tell the patient, and we don't know that much right now, but we tell the patient, uh, you know, the eight cells and above have, have a greater chance of forming a blastocyst, but that doesn't mean the less than eight cells don't have a chance to do it. It may not be as high, but that's an opinion. That's not data driven yet for us. Very good. Uh, well, we have more questions. Uh, some of them are coming from the audience and some of them I have them here. Uh, but I think we're gonna jump quickly into the poll results. Uh, Riley, if you can show us the image <coughs> or the three images, and then we will uh, look at the polls one by one. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, so right now we're looking at group one. Okay, so and before we get the result, let's take a quick uh, pull from the uh, from the panel. What grade is this? Um, I'll be in the I'd call it a four AA, but I see a little bit of debris in there. Okay. Four AA for me. Okay. You you guys agree, huh? <laughs> Good I thing we're to. married. Maybe all I have to agree. <laughs> okay. Uh, my embryologist graded this one as a four BA. Or BA. I agree, and I agree with, uh, with her. Okay, David? I'd give it a 4AA. Okay, 4AA. And you, Kim? I give it a 4AA, assuming that little glob at uh, about three o'clock is not a hatching, has cells hatching out. Wow, so you guys pretty much agree. All, all four. 4AA, one, uh, four, four AAs, and one 4BA. Okay. So let's look at the results from the audience. Riley? Okay. So the majority, it's a split between a 4AA and a 5AA. 43.9% 4AA, 36.6% 5AA. <coughs> and then we have all the other categories, AB, AA. We have a 3AA a little bit but the majority for AA and 5A. Okay, let's mm -hmm. go to the next one. Okay, I'll start with you, um, Debbie, the same same order. Um, I think I called this, I can't remember, a 1BB. Okay. Or Bill? just early last. Sure. Bill? Um, I was conflicted between the two. Um, I, I definitely call them ones. I would say the one on the right isn't as good as the one on the left. Now, is that a loose cell or is that the inner cell mass on the left right there in the middle? So I would call the one on the left of one AA and the one on the, the uh, right side, uh, one uh, BA at this B point in time. Perfect. There's not many cells there. Okay, how about you, Zeki? I would call them one BB for both, basically. For especially, both. At the, especially at the um, early blasts stage like these guys. I mean, 
it's, it's really hard to, hard to just see an ICM and try to do that ICM grading as we, de as we describe in the um, Gardner uh, or modify the Gardner system. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I just look at the, at the early blastocyst stages, just the appearance of cells, quality of the trophic derm cells, and if there is a, an appearance of ICM, basically. But I agree with it, one BB for both. Yeah, we don't, we don't grade at this stage. Yeah. My lab doesn't grade at this stage. David? Yeah, we don't grade at this stage either. We'd call them both early blasts. OK. Uh, and Kim? Uh, I would also say I would just call them ones. I wouldn't grade them at all. I'm okay. not going to use my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what you need. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what the audience have voted, uh, Riley. Okay, 2BB, 26.8%, uh, 1BB, 14.6, and 3BB, 12.2. So I would say 1BB and 2BB and 3BB, those are the major, the majority of, of the embryos. I would say it's definitely not a three. No. Okay. I don't think any of us on the panel would call that a three. Okay. So okay. It, it's a 1BB, at best, two BB. Yeah, one or two is debatable, but three is, I don't, yeah. Very good. Fantastic. Let's go to the next one. David? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that that's hatching out on the top, so I'm calling that a five AA. Okay. Bill? Um, I'm going to really prep this up because this is one of mine. So this is a beautiful frozen thawed embryo just from the other day. Um, and the reason it's hatching is we already uh, put a, a hole in the zona. So this was a 4AA, but since it is hatching now with the, the hatching that we did. Very good. Um, I have to agree with Debbie, I'm getting hungry for dinner, so. <laughs> <laughs> Zeki? Oh uh, yeah, I would I would go with it for B A uh, with this one. I don't know. Everybody tells me I'm a little bit stingy in terms of grading ICM ICM actually. Yeah. So because of that slightly uh, you know granular appearance, I would just basically grade it down a little bit and probably I would say for B A instead of for B B. But again, I mean this yeah. I, I I I was known for that. I'm stingy on that. <laughs> David. I would call it a 5AA. 5AA, perfect. And Kim? A 4BA, loose ICM. 4BA, perfect. Uh, Riley, can you put the stats? Okay, 4B, uh, 5BA, 24.4%, and 4BA, 22%. So the majority are on the BA, 5 or 4. And then yeah. we have the A, that is 14%, 14.6%. 14 so I think most people agreed with Zeb that it's those little grant. I can see the granularities in the ICM and would potentially downgrade it. So I would, I wouldn't argue with that. I would agree. Any of those would be fair, fair grades. So, so you would adjust your call maybe to a five. No, a? no, no. I'm not adjusting my call. I'm confident. <laughs> Nabil, come on. But no, I, I definitely, I'm not going to argue with anybody and say it's. Uh-huh. I think your voice thank, is- Thank you, Debbie, for sticking up for uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad they bleeped those words out, Debbie. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so the next images, we're going to go to the audience directly so we can save some time. Riley, okay. can you just give us the images and the answers? Oh, yeah, I didn't like this one. Yeah, I loved it. It was mine. <laughs> okay, can you go back to the image for and keep it for about five seconds or so? Okay, so that's how the, it looks like. Yeah. Let's look at the numbers. 4CC, 38.9%. This is one of your Cinderella embryos, right, Kim? What? This is one of your Cinderella embryos, I said. That's right. All <laughs> of mine were Cinderella embryos that I sent in. The majority has vote, <coughs> have voted for 4CC, 38.9%. 4CB, 22%, and then we have 4BC, 
Now, yeah, everyone, you... on the, everyone on the panel, would you, is this keepable? Are you biopsying and freezing this? I would actually honestly like to roll that around a little bit to see if that inner cell mass is solid or not, because there's a lot of cells that aren't compacted in there yeah. that make me a little nervous. Very good. Can we go, Riley, can we go to the videos? Uh, I think we have two videos that we voted on. Let's look at that. That's Debbie's embryo. Maybe you can play it one more time. I'm still playing. Uh -huh. Okay. Perfect. Let's look at the score. Forty one point seven percent for CB, sixteen point seven percent for BB. And then the rest, uh, almost a uh, similar. Percentage. Okay, so here's a little tip. I want everyone to look at that data because the next embryo is the same exact embryo, but I just <laughs> rolled it a little bit. So I'm interested to see if there's still 41% of the people call it a 4CB. Would you guys agree on this uh, scoring on the majority being a 4CB? Yep. Within that range. Okay. I wouldn't be as nice. I would probably say 4CC. Yeah, yeah me I would too. too. Okay, 4CB to 4CC. Okay. Yeah, I don't like I don't like the trophy. I definitely call the trophy C. Okay, let's go to the next to the next video. I think that's the same embryo from a different. It is the same embryo, but it's rolled a little bit. Okay. So it appears to be a little different. Oh, it does. Yeah, isn't that cool? Does it look better? Yeah. The trophectoderm does. Yeah. So now it's going to be upgraded, huh? So I'm interested to see what the poll is. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, look at that. See? Isn't that <laughs> cool? Yep. That's what I was hoping to see. Interesting. So, so yes. that's what you wanted to show us, right? It depends on how you exactly. look at it. Exactly. So I could tell when I, when I focused up and down on that embryo that the inner cell mass was on the bottom and I couldn't get a good view. So I went back, I rolled it a little bit and put it back up and it looked a lot better. So even though we can focus in and up, up and down through an embryo, it just depends on how the embryo is positioned as to how we're gonna be grading it. So little tiny things like that. So Very it's good. so effective. This is excellent. So that's, that's a really a good, a good way of uh, uh, looking at an embryo from more than one perspective, right? Right. Perfect. So let's, uh, I think this is enough for scoring embryos. Uh, let's look at one of the questions that the attendees uh, audience have asked. Let me see. I think I was looking at the, the questions and there is a question from Philip. Uh, how well does the time-lapse morphology system correlate with the Gardner's gradient system? Does anyone here use um, the time-lapse? And if so, does it correlate with, with the Gardner? I don't use time-lapse. Okay. I don't, but I would suspect that it doesn't completely correlate. Yeah. Yeah. That's my suspect, so I don't know. Well, the, I, I, I didn't use it on a regular basis, but I tried it on a demo basis a couple, uh, couple of months, not here, but in Las Vegas. Uh, but first of all, I mean, even though we are looking at the morphology uh, in the time-lapse imaging system, we are just basically putting the extra uh, layer of kinetics rather than just looking at the embryo. I mean, when, when those movements happen, when, when the fertilization, happens, when the fornuclei uh, formation happens and then the divisions, and that's a, it's, a, it's a complete, I mean, it's kind of difficult to make a comparison uh, basically between these two systems because uh, both based on uh, morphology, but uh, in the time-lapse system, you are adding the kinetic uh, information on top of it as well. But even with that, even with that, I mean, if you look at the literature, it's, it's kind of, uh, con controversial. I mean, even with the kinetic information included in the in the system, the outcomes or the predict uh, the ability of that uh, time lapse imaging system to predict uh, outcome is not very well established. It's a controversial. I mean, there are 
because there, there are there are uh, I mean a lot of uh, data in the literature provi provides the uh, you know positive in, even better than uh, typical morphological assessment uh, outcomes, but uh, there are a lot of uh, controversial data as well. So I think it is uh, the ju jury is out uh, uh, out on that issue at the moment, as far as I uh, as far as I'm concerned. Very good. Any other comments? On this? I've just always heard that time lapses, uh, uh, mainly for uh, cleavage stage transfer, <coughs> and I haven't heard any uh, anyone that's uh, using it for uh, blastocyst transfers. Thank you so much. Any other comments before we go into the next question? So the next question is on the correlation. Uh, between embryo grade and floydy. And I think um, some, some of you have mentioned a little bit about that correlation. Do we know, do we have any data correlating? Uh, and does that data exist on correlation? Yeah. No, no, Actually, no, you are the one who right has now. that data. <laughs> I'm gonna get into this in a second. <laughs> <laughs> lab that I'm in right now actually has some amazing data that I was asking them today. Why, did, why haven't you published this? Because they have a ton of data. And obviously the four AAs did have the highest euploid rate, but the interesting thing was a four BA had a higher euploidy rate over a four AB. Wow. So I thought that was really interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um, any, any other comments? I have data that I want to share with you guys that is also very interesting the way I see it. So this is a data. Uh, are you guys able to see the, the slide? Yes. Yes. So oh, yes. This is a data we collected from more than 35,000 embryos on how people grade their embryos. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the embryos from 35 years old patients yep. all the way to 42, the grade seems very similar. They, you have the same distribution. You have about 20% in AA, 20% in AB or BA, and then 40, about 40% 40 in BB. Wow. Then you drop back to 15% in BC and CB. Then a very little CCs, I guess, because people don't biopsy or uh, CCs, don't, that's why we don't have we have the less of a CC group. Um, the, the other things that we notice here is when you look at egg donor, you have more AAs, which is 30%, and they have less BBs, which is instead of 40, they have about 30. My question to you guys, because I know that the majority of people tend to, this is a subjective scoring, so these are euploid rates, or these are just the number of, uh, the percentage yeah, of embryos? What, what are these, yeah. All embryos. All embryos. So you don't, are you gonna show us euploid? I, I don't have that yet. Oh, Nabil, come on. Nabil, yes, Nabil. <laughs> that's, that's what <laughs> Zeki was asking. I will work on it. I promise I will share that. But I want you to, I want you to separate out the AB and the BA. Yes. Because that's the whole, what's, what's more important to us, the trophectoderm or the, or the ICM. And it appears that we get a lot more euploids in BAs. Yes. So what I see from this slide, and thank you for saying that, Debbie, because I think that's a great observation. But what it, what was surprised me in this slide um, that patients, regardless of their age, 35 to to 42, the distribution of AA all the way to BC and CB seems very similar. Um, uh, CC tends to be higher at older age in this slide. Is this something that you would expect with different age group or, it is, or, or am I reading this uh, wrong? Because I think if you have certain bias in scoring, you may tend to go to the middle. Most of your grading may go towards the BBs rather than BC or AB. What is your interpretation of this, um, David? Well, I just think if you ask Zeki and Kim, they, they grade everything BB. They're very strict, so. Yeah, okay. 
Very good. So, okay, so let's go back to the... Um, um, uh, Bill, I mean, yes. this, this same data with the uh, ploy the information would be nice, actually. It would be really nice. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, I will work on that for sure. Okay, so let me just uh, and share this so I can and go to the next question. Um, you guys talked about the correlation between correl uh, between embryo grade and euploidy. Um, I guess th there is a similar trend between embryo grade and implantation rates and pregnancy rates. Can we assume that is the case as well that they are correlated? Do you guys agree that, that if an embryo looks can good- you, Can you repeat that, Nabil? From my point, I didn't hear your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, very good. Okay, so I think we have another question from Kinga. And I think uh, Debbie did, did answer that question, but I'm gonna ask it one more time. If you have two embryos with the same grade, one day five and the other one day six, which one would you transfer? I would go for day five. Okay. I always know. Yeah, we would go day five first. Right. Kim, any preference? Yeah, I think most people choose a day five, similar grades. Yes. Very good. But I want to discard the other one. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, I think that's most of the questions we have collected so far. Um, we have only one last question, uh, one poll that we have released. But before we get into the poll, I'm gonna ask this question. The, um, most of you have agreed that the scoring system is subjective. And if you put two or three people at the same time, they may score slightly differently. Although you guys did agree uh, in the majority of the calls that you made. Is it doable or is it um, a, a better way of scoring uh, embryos using some sort of uh, programs or uh, that will detect the same feature the same way, score them the same way, some sort of artificial intelligence. Is it the right time to have a tool like that for embryo scoring? Bill? Yeah, I think a lot of people are working on that now. So um, it's promising. I mean, to take photo, you know, photos and all the way through. Uh, so what was transferred and what was, what was the result of that transfer and not only if it's positive or negative, but ones that are lost too. So um, yeah, I think that's gonna be the future. Yeah, so, and, and you're probably talking about um, looking at the embryo uh, potential, implantation potential based on images. But what I'm saying is just pure scoring. Is it, uh, is it possible or is it, uh, you know, uh, useful, uh, useful to have a, a, an AI that will do garner for you instead of you using your judgments on that particular time. Gotcha. Uh, so we're using AI to grade the embryo for us or to choose of to, the grades? Grade to to grade. grade. I barely trust ourselves. It's so subjective between us. And especially if we're giving it a two dimensional picture, you can't, it's, it needs to have a pretty good brain because I feel like you have to grade an embryo from a 3D image. If you yeah. don't have a 3D image, you're not accurately grading that embryo. Maybe a video because there are AIs that also can score videos that will look at particular features on the embryo, but they have the same system of scoring. There is no bias. I think the human bias is what makes the two calls different from, from a person to another. Yeah. I definitely agree with you on that. I've never used the embryo scope. I mean, isn't that what the embryo scope is doing? Is the embryo scope? No, it's looking, it's looking at like the timing of division and stuff like that. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, more I, timing, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. That was the oh, last it's more time. timing than it is uh, appearance. Correct. Yeah. I think an AI system would be great. And I think like Debbie said, it's gonna to need to take a video and look at that and be able to grade it. But at least it will give us a chance. Up till now, we've had no chance of using grades. And I think we can all grade the very top embryos very easily and the very bottom embryos 
very easily. It's the middle grade. Yeah. Maybe that's why start only has three grades. <laughs> yes. But I, I, can I, can I chime in? I mean, uh, we could, I believe that I mean, with the AI or uh, tech, tech, technological uh, advancement, we can just basically better grade these embryos uh, and we can take out the human subjectivity a little better. But uh, it also goes down to what we are measuring. I mean, what we are measuring the morphology is so variable. I mean, as you see those the pictures, I mean, this is only a small portion of uh, you know yeah. possible pictures you can come out with these embryos. I mean, uh, during the years, I mean, imagine what you have seen. I mean, the variability in the morphological, uh, you know, mor morphology of the embryos so big, so variable, and uh, just basically associating those uh, specific parameters to outcomes or meaningful information is the difficult part. And in that sense, uh, I am not very hopeful. I mean, that's right. This could be a give you, you know, more uh, or less subjective assessment of the grade, but I am not sure if it is gonna be, unless we throw other parameters in the, in the mix. Uh, I, would be, I would be surprised to just by, you know, doing a better or less subjective, uh, uh, Assess morphological assessment is going to give us a better uh, outcome because the uh, the nature of what we are uh, measuring is basically the problem. It is it's extremely variable, uh, a lot of variables in there, and it, it is really difficult to just correlate those two the outcomes basically. So Zicky, basically what you're saying is we have a poor system already. How do we expect to improve it by keep on using a poor system? Well. Yeah. If you're gonna keep, if you're gonna keep everything same, yes, uh, same, same parameter, yes. But I think we should. I mean, but I believe and I'm hopeful that we're gonna be able to toss other parameters in this in the system, and it's gonna improve uh, in the long term. Yes. That's but but I I would agree with you. We have a poor system for grading, really. You know, we all we don't know if there's any difference between an A or a B yeah, in yeah, any absolutely. embryos relates to implantation rate, or for that matter, between a C even. We think there is one, but. You know, we haven't really looked at it and spent the time to measure it. We don't have a good measuring tool right well, now. And I think, I think something have, else. Oh, go ahead. Yes. I was going to say, I think what we have is a system that helps out a physician and in yeah. some sense, a patient. The physician's not going to look at the embryo in most cases. He wants you to say it's a AB or a CC, no, no. and then he kind of gets some gestalt about what that is. I was just going to add in there that. I don't, I don't think any of us mentioned this, but I think we all might have to agree that this does happen to some degree is that it depends on the patient cohort of embryos. If you have an, a patient that has 15 embryos and she's got six AAs and you get into those middle bottoms and you're like B, C, you know, it doesn't matter. She has all these AA embryos. Whereas you have a patient that only has one blastocyst and it doesn't look awesome you might tend to grade that a little bit better because you have sympathy for the patient and that's all they have. And so you might grade something a BC instead of a CC because that's, that's all she has. And you don't want to walk into the room and say, you know, all you have is a CC. Yeah. So I don't know. I know I'm totally guilty. Yeah, we call it conditional grading and we do it on, <laughs> on decision of making, you know, you vitrify or not. And it depends on if, if a, if a patient has, you know, 10 embryos already vitrified, frozen, then you have yeah. a tendency to remain, to just grade those. And then you're going to call it CCs and not freeze it because she already has 10. We're good. We're calling that a CC. Yep. It's gone. Uh, but, you know. Dean Morbeck did a study on that. Just that. They showed photos around and gave different scenarios to the embryologists. I can't remember. Uh, it must have been human reproduction that was published, but it showed that we are biased. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. And you know, if you have thousands of uh, videos and, and you have a program that looks exactly the same area of the embryo, I am sure it's gonna be less biased than a human, for sure. And you may see things that you don't see, right? Because Sometimes we might want that bias when we're yeah. sympathizing with the patient. Mm, yeah. If the AI system is telling me this is a CC, I'm gonna be like, no, no, I'm giving yeah. it a BC <laughs> or a CB because I have to get a little B in there for the patient's yeah. sanity. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, had, day, I've, I've had patients that, you know, you transfer the AAs, three or four of them, and repetitive, uh, you know, uh, negatives, and then you put that CC in, and you're like, this is the last resort, 
and the last resort is catches on. Yeah, it's crazy. It's we 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 need a better system. Yeah, yeah, very good. When we asked the audience uh, if they would be interested in participating in the multi-center research projects on using AI for scoring embryos. Um, and 69% says they would be interested. So two thirds uh, seem interested in, in exploring AI or, or some other ways, uh, automatic ways for scoring. Very good work. Guys, thank you so much. This has been really great fun. I think we had fun scoring and, and comparing the scores and all that. Thank you so much for your expertise and, and, and for your contribution. I'm sure there are tons of embryologists <coughs> looking at you guys and learning from you. And I appreciate the chance that you have given them uh, in this uh, workshop. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank and you. I will see you next time. Thanks for having Thank us. Thanks, Thanks you all. Thanks Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Well, good afternoon for some. <laughs> yeah.